Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. We're going to start a playlist here where we talk about the lymphatic system. And I wanted to do a playlist on this because I feel like the lymphatic system is sort of the stepchild of anatomy and physiology. Um, it's one of them that's often neglected. Um, some classes don't even cover it. Um, from what I've seen. And then if they do cover it, they kind of gloss over it and don't really go into a whole lot of detail. Uh, but the lymphatic system is actually kind of an unsung hero. It's actually a really cool system. And it's important to understand because there are fairly common medical conditions that you would see working in a hospital uh, that are actually a direct result of some failure of the lymphatic system. Okay? In fact, one of those, which we'll eventually talk about in a later video, once we have a good understanding of this, is this condition right here, which is called chronic cellulitis. Okay? But let's talk about the lymphatic system. And in the first video here, we're just going to introduce the various components of the lymphatic system. And so the first thing is lymph. Okay, so what is lymph? Lymph is the fluid that's transported in lymphatic vessels. Now, lymphatic vessels, which we'll talk about uh, in a little more detail in later videos, um, are very similar to arteries and veins, except they don't carry blood. So all of these strings, these green strings that you see in the legs right here, and they're, of course, elsewhere, but these are lymphatic vessels. Okay. Um, when we typically draw them, we draw them green, even though they're not green in real life. You know, arteries are red, veins are typically blue, nerves are yellow. Lymphatic vessels and most lymph structures are green. So these are our lymphatic vessels, and they carry a substance called lymph. Okay. And lymph is a milky fluid, similar to blood, but it contains a lot of proteins excess fluid that has been filtered into the interstitial area, and then pathogens from tissues and the interstitium. Okay, so let's recall in blood vessel physiology, when you go to the capillary bed, and we'll talk about this more in a separate video, here's a capillary bed. We have, here's an arterial feeding the capillary bed. Here's the venule draining it. And then, of course, we have the arterial end of the capillary and the venous end of the capillary. Uh, and remember that at the arterial end of the capillary, there's a greater hydrostatic blood pressure. There's a lower hydrostatic blood pressure on the venous end. And so what that causes is on the arterial end of the capillary bed, we have net filtration, which remember filtration is the bulk flow of fluid and other particles, but mainly we're concerned about the fluid from the inside of these vessels that are capillaries into the interstitium, which is another term for the interstitial fluid. Now, out of the fluid that is filtered out into the interstitial areas out here, only about 85% of it is reabsorbed on the venous end of the capillary bed. Because remember, at the venous end, because the hydrostatic pressure is lower, you actually have a different process. You actually have reabsorption that occurs. And so fluid will move from the interstitium into the capillaries. But it's not a 100% efficient process. Only about 85% of that fluid that's filtered is reabsorbed. And so the question is, what happens to the other 15% that's not reabsorbed? Well, it turns out those are going to be reabsorbed via lymphatic capillaries. And we'll talk more about how these capillaries eventually form vessels in one of the future videos. But for now, understand that that fluid that gets reabsorbed into the lymphatic vessels ultimately has to make its way back into the venous system. And so they're going to travel up these lymphatic vessels and they're going to encounter other structures called lymph nodes, which we'll talk about, and ultimately get that fluid back into the venous system. Okay, so the lymphatic system is very important for, we'll look at this right now, fluid return to the blood. That's one major function of the lymphatic system. Fluid return to the blood that gets filtered but not reabsorbed by the capillaries. Okay, another important thing about lymph is that because it's draining fluid from the interstitium, it might also pick up pathogens that have managed to find their way into the interstitial regions, right? So the lymphatic system has another function, and that is mounting an immune response. And we're going to talk about that with respect to lymph nodes. So if we take a little zoom in right here, let's look at one of these legs, we can follow any one of these lymphatic vessels up, and eventually they're going to converge at these round structures that we see uh, throughout uh, the body. And they tend to be clustered in certain areas. For example, we have uh, some popliteal ones around the knee region, 
We have some inguinal ones right here. Um, there's um, some in the axillary regions, some in the cervical regions up here. Uh, these are called lymph nodes. And we're going to talk about lymph nodes more in the next video, but it suffices to say for now that the fluid that's moving in these lymphatic vessels is eventually going to make its way to a lymph node. Okay, And the cool thing about lymph nodes is that they house white blood cells for immune responses. In fact, um, any one of these lymphatic organs that we're going to talk about that houses white blood cells for the purpose of mounting an immune response is termed a secondary lymphatic organ. Okay. Now, the lymph nodes, as I mentioned, collect lymph from converging lymphatic vessels, and there are white blood cells just waiting there, and they're waiting to mount an immune response against any pathogens that might be present in that lymph. So remember, that lymph is fluid drained from the interstitium, but that interstitium could contain a pathogen, and so if that pathogen manages to get into the lymph, then these lymph nodes sort of act as checkpoints. And so if a pathogen comes in there, then the white blood cells that are in there will mount an immune response against the pathogen. And we're going to see other organs of the lymphatic system, such as the spleen, some others later, that do this same thing. And again, those organs that house white blood cells for the purpose of mounting an immune response against pathogens in some kind of fluid, these are called secondary lymphatic organs. Okay, Now, the pathogens that are in the lymph nodes, and, and of course this is going to be true of other secondary lymphatic organs, they're kind of like the TSA agents at an airport. Okay, So if you're not in the United States, I don't know exactly what you might have at your airports, but in the United States, we have TSA. And of course we've got you know things like metal detectors right here. You have to send your bags to these conveyor belts that scan things, and then you've got various agents here, TSA agents, that are going to check the bags and, and so on and so forth. So imagine you've got a bag right here, okay? And this bag is like the lymph. Okay? And what the TSA agents are monitoring for are things like weapons or things that could be used as weapons and so on and so forth to protect, protect the passengers. And so this, this lymph, this baggage, has to go through several checkpoints. It has to go through the metal detectors. I think this might be one over here that corresponds to this lane. So here's a metal detector. Here's another one. That's one checkpoint. And of course, we've got lots of TSA agents just waiting that are going to be checking that lymph for its contents to see if there's anything harmful. And these TSA agents are like the white blood cells. And the major two that we house in secondary lymphatic organs are B cells and T cells. Okay? So as this lymph is moving through, if there's no problems, then these agents right here aren't going to be alerted to anything if there's no issues. But if there was something harmful in this baggage, the agents are going to detect that and they're going to have a response against it, right, to protect the passengers. So it's kind of like that. The baggage is the lymph and these agents are like the B and T cells, which are our white blood cells. And if they detect something bad in the lymph, they're going to mount an immune response. Okay, And that's the function of a secondary lymphatic organ. It just so happens that the lymph nodes are monitoring the contents of the lymph for pathogens. Okay, Let's look at the spleen. So the spleen is actually right here. It's actually on the patient's left side. And the spleen has two functions. One, it's the graveyard of red blood cells, so it's responsible for degrading old, damaged red blood cells and platelets. But the spleen is also a secondary lymphatic organ. We'll talk about the spleen in more detail in another video. But understand that the spleen also contains B cells and T cells. And so, because it's not lymph that runs through the spleen, it's actually blood, the spleen's second function here in the lymphatic system is to monitor the contents of the blood for pathogens. And so as blood is moving through the spleen, if the blood contains a pathogen, then the B cells and T cells that are just waiting there will mount an immune response against that pathogen. So the spleen's very important for blood immunity, and we would call that humoral immunity. Okay. Um, one thing I'll also mention here, I'll come back, is the thymus. The thymus, which we can actually see right up here, the thymus is the site of T-cell maturation. So in children and, and infants, the thymus is going to be important for producing T-cells. Now, white blood cells are produced in the bone marrow, but they are matured, that is, T-cells are matured in the thymus. 
So as a child, your thymus is very important for pumping out lots of different T cell populations. And eventually those T cells will migrate to the various uh, secondary lymphatic organs, such as lymph nodes that we just talked about, and the spleen, and others. Okay. Once you get to adulthood, however, the thymus is going to atrophy and it will not play a role in T cell maturation anymore. Um, the T cell maturation will actually be done in other uh, secondary lymphatic organs. Okay? But the thymus is very important for this T cell maturation in children and infants. Okay? The next structure we're going to look at is what's called the cisterna chile. The cisterna chile is sort of like a very large lymph node. Okay. Um, it's situated a little bit above the navel. And so what you can sort of think about with this is, if we zoom in right here, uh, pretty much if you go to the level of the navel, pretty much every single lymph node, if you look at the efferent vessels coming off of each of these lymph nodes, they're pretty much all going to con converge at the cisterna chile. So that means pretty much all the fluid that's drained from the legs and the inguinal region right here, all of that fluid, all these vessels are going to converge at this structure right here, which is called the cisterna chile. And it's really just a little bit above the navel level. Okay? And the purpose of the cisterna chile is not only to act as a checkpoint, because it's also a secondary lymphatic organ and houses white blood cells, but it allows all the fluid to collect here into a common structure, and then that fluid will be transported in one larger vessel upwards. Okay, so that's the cisterna chile. All these efferent vessels that are coming from these lymph nodes, okay, they all converge here, at least the ones that are below the cisterna chile. If we look at the ones that are up here, they don't necessarily uh, uh, converge there. Okay, they actually just go straight down into a particular duct. Okay, but if we look even closer at this cisterna chile right here, let's actually zoom in a little more, we see that it has a very large efferent vessel that comes off of it, and if we follow that upwards, we see it'll actually go behind the thymus, and then it'll kind of loop around here, and this loop right here is called the thoracic duct. Okay? That's called the thoracic duct. So we're actually going to look at what the thoracic duct does right here. The thoracic duct returns fluid to the left subclavian and internal jugular veins. So you can't see any of the veins here. But essentially, the thoracic duct, which is the terminal part of the cisterna chile's uh, etherent vessel, that thoracic duct is going to dump that fluid back into the left subclavian and internal jugular veins. So that means that any fluid from the left leg, the right leg, really the abdominal region right here, all that fluid is going to be converged into the cisterna chile and then moved up here through the thoracic duct and then dumped into the left subclavian vein and the left internal jugular vein. Okay? Now, there is another one that's actually not shown here. It's actually on the patient's right side, and it's called the right lymphatic duct. And it plays a similar role, except it drains a different side of the body, which we'll actually look at on the next slide. But essentially, the right lymphatic duct is going to play a very similar role to the thoracic duct, except it's going to return fluid to the right subclavian vein and the right internal jugular vein. So hopefully these two slides right here give you a good look at some of the a more commonly discussed secondary lymphatic structures, and then also some pieces of the lymphatic system. Now I mentioned that the thoracic duct is going to return fluid to the left subclavian and internal jugular veins, and the right lymphatic duct is going to do the same thing, but with the right side, so the right subclavian and right internal jugular vein. What we can talk about now is we can talk about the selective drainage by the lymphatic system. Okay. So this is kind of a nice picture right here because what it shows is the various parts of the body that are drained by a particular uh, duct. There's the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. If we look at this region right here that's kind of this uh, off green color, we see it includes the right half of the head and neck, the right pectoral region, really just this region right here, goes on a little bit inferior to that, and then the right arm. All of these regions are drained into the right lymphatic duct. So it doesn't matter if it's the hand, the antibrachial region, the brachial region. If you look at any one of these regions contained in this off-green color, all those lymphatic vessels are going to converge at lymph nodes, which are then going to converge at 
the right lymphatic duct. Okay? And that right lymphatic duct is going to take that fluid, that lymph, and dump it into the right subclavian vein and the right internal jugular vein. And hopefully you can see that the right lymphatic duct actually drains a minority percentage of the body. If we compare it to the thoracic duct, which is everything else in this kind of off-red color, we see that the thoracic duct is going to drain a much larger region of the body. So the thoracic duct is going to drain a fluid from the left side of the head and neck, the left side of the torso, really the entire abdominal region, the left arm, and both legs. And so any fluid from here, of course, is going to go either directly to the thoracic duct, or it's going to go to the cisterna chile, which will then go to the thoracic duct. But in any case, if any fluid goes to the thoracic duct, it's going to be returned to the left subclavian and internal jugular vein. Okay. And so one common question that we, we can ask about the lymphatic system is give you a particular part of the body. Just point to one region. Let's say the left shoulder. And we can say which lymphatic duct drains this region. And you would have to know the various regions uh, that are drained by each of these ducts. And of course, if I was pointing to the left shoulder, that would actually be the thoracic duct. Okay. Here's another look at this with the actual veins. Here we see the cisterna chile down here. We see that its efferent vessel is going to go upwards, upwards. It'll actually go behind both the thymus, or what's left of it as an adult, go behind this vein right here, which is the brachiocephalic vein, that is the left one. It'll kind of loop around, and then it will dump into uh, the, the left jugular vein and the left subclavian vein. Okay? Um, the right lymphatic duct is going to be over here. Okay. And we can see, of course, that this is going to take fluid from the right side of the head, this area right here, and then the right arm, and it's going to return that fluid into the blood through the right jugular vein and the right subclavian vein. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Now, in the next video, we're going to be discussing the anatomy and physiology of lymph nodes, and I hope you join us then. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.